Hey, welcome to our series, Built by God. It's based on this, this principle that God is always working on the inside of us. We're gonna walk through Nehemiah. There's some incredible truths as he is building walls that God, this plan that God laid upon his heart, walls and gates that are destroyed. But here's the truth that uh, as God was using a man like Nehemiah to build walls and gates, that process actually is happening on the inside of you and I every day. The Bible says that we're supposed to work out our salvation. The Bible also says that God will build his church. So hey, we can't wait for you to come along and be a part of this series. We know this truth that God is always in the construction business. So come on, join us for Built by God. Well, y'all, I'm going to put the word in the microwave right now. Um, I walked in, I said, Holy Spirit, will you take over? And he did. So that's my favorite thing. It's my favorite thing. But I do believe I have a, a word. We're wrapping up today this series that we've been on called Built by God. And we've walked through the book of Nehemiah. How many of you have done that with us? You've been a part of that. If you've missed any of those messages, you can go back on YouTube. You can look at them and listen to them and get them in your spirit. You know, when we hear things one time, it's never enough. That's why the word says, he says in his word, meditate on his word. That means we need to get it in us over and over and over and over and hear it and read it and say it and hear it and read it and say it. Because we need to get the word of God on the inside of us. Amen. So we've been in this series. We've talked about being part of a team. We had a whole part about the draft. We talked about being in unity with one purpose and one vision. We've talked about learning to fight while you build something. Has anybody ever had to fight and build at the same time? We talked about not being distracted by the enemy. And we've talked about finishing what you start right? Because God always finishes what he starts. He's a completer. He finishes what he starts. And so this wall behind me, this little concrete wall, it's been a representation of when something, it started out in ruins, and now you see it's a structure. And that's what God's building on the inside of you and I. Amen? So um, we've kind of walked all the way up through about Nehemiah 8 and 9, and I'm going to give you a super fast summary of Nehemiah 10, 11, and 12. Are you ready? Because we're going to camp out actually in chapter 13 today. So in Nehemiah 10 through 12, all of the people, the wall's been built, Nehemiah's been leading them, there are priests who are leading them, there are Levites who are the worshipers, and they've been leading them, and they list so many names in chapters 10, 11, and 12, and you should go and read all those names. But the main thing they're focused on is they begin talking about their ancestors that went before. The children of Israel, and they're like, when they were unfaithful, God was faithful. And when they were hungry, God gave them manna. And when they were thirsty, he brought water out of a rock. And even though they kept searching and looking and, and all these things, God always came through. So they began to celebrate what God had done, knowing he was going to continue to do what he has always done. And so they had this big celebration where they declared and they rehearsed victories. I mean, you know, it's important to rehearse victories in our lives. We need to remember what God did because that helps us not get amnesia for what we think he's not going to do. So we need to remember what he did. So that's what they begin to do in Nehemiah 10. And they're talking and sharing and they all decide we are not going to go back. We're going to make a covenant today before God. And they make this big commitment, this covenant they, they bring this thing and there are certain priests and Levites, they come and sign it with their name. They seal it. Why? Because they wanted everything God did. The wall was just a representation of bringing them back to God, of bringing them closer to God, of restoring worship, of restoring prosperity, of restoring God's relationship to them. So that's what was happening. So in, in 10, 11, 12, they're just celebrating that was their party. They're like, we're going to make a covenant. We're going to party. We're going to remember. And so at that time, I, I'm just going to read quickly, and I'm sorry I did not give them this scripture back there, but don't worry. Nehemiah 10, um, 37 to 39. So this is, they, they're celebrating and they're creating this covenant. 
<clears throat> and they say, moreover, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, to the first of our ground meal, of our grain offerings, of the fruit of all of our trees, of our new wine and olive oil. We will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. A priest descended from Aaron is coming to accompany the Levites when they receive the tithes. And they're going to bring a tenth of the tithes up to the house of our God, to the storerooms of the treasury. The people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms. Pay attention to that part where the articles for the sanctuary and for the ministering priests, the gatekeepers and the musicians are also kept. And they ended chapter 29 by saying, we will not neglect the house of God. So here's this point. They're celebrating, but everything comes back to their obedience. All of a sudden, everything comes back to, oh my goodness, now we're so ready. We've been talking about generosity. We say all the time, 10% of everything you have belongs to God. That is your tithe. You're supposed to bring first fruit offerings. You're supposed to bring your best to him, not your leftovers. And that includes with your money. That includes with your worship. It's all of it. And so this was an example of what was happening. Are you guys with me? Y'all are awfully quiet. It's okay. I'm going to stir you up here in a minute. So the people of God, they came, they repented, they rebuilt, they repented, they rebuilt, they repented, they rebuilt, they worshiped. So all this was happening. And you remember we talked about the opposition of Sanballat and Tobiah that came. And it was this full, upfront opposition. Have you ever had anybody confront you right in the front, right up front, in front of everybody and everything? This has happened over and over and over. And so they felt so confident God had restored Jerusalem. They had this strong leader. They were determined. They had overcome the enemy. So now we get all the way to the last chapter of Nehemiah, chapter 13. And let me just tell you this. When the enemy cannot get through the front of your life, he will be patient enough to wait to get somewhere in the back. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And if I could title this message anything, I would title it, When You Kick the Enemy Out. That's what we're going to talk about today. When you kick the enemy out. Not somebody else doing it for you. When you kick the enemy out of some places in your life. So we get all the way here, like I said, in, in chapter 13. And so many times we don't realize how sly, how deceptive that the enemy is. And you say, Angelo, every time you get up here, you talk so much about the enemy. That's because you have to be aware of his tactics. You have to know his strategies because you will find yourself right in the middle of his trap. We've talked about offenses. We've talked about distractions. All these things. Who sets those up? The enemy. So we have to recognize where he gets in, how he gets in, and how to deal with him. And so look with me in Nehemiah 13, and we're going to read this all together. You guys open. I'm reading out of NIV today. Nehemiah 13 and verse 1, on that day the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people and there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God because they had not met the Israelites with food and water but they had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing and when the people heard this law, they, ex they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Verse 4. Before this, Elisheb, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms. Now we just read in verse 10, everybody, I mean in chapter 10, everybody's so excited. They're like, we're back, we're bringing our stuff, we're coming back to the house of God. And they're bringing all their offerings and all of their first fruits and all of their tithes and all of these things. And they're bringing them and putting them in the storerooms of the temple. 
So it says in verse 4, Elishab the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. And he was closely associated with Tobiah. Does anybody remember that name? Tobiah. And he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and the temple articles and also the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priest. Verse 6, but while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of the king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission to come back to Jerusalem. And this is Nehemiah talking. So he returns back. And here I learned about the evil thing that Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased. And I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a minute. So I hope you're following with me what has happened. So Nehemiah, they built this wall. God's done everything he said. He's been faithful. The people have repented. All these things are going great. We've conquered the enemy. We're good. How many of you know when you let your guard down is when the enemy starts looking for a way into your life, your family, your finances, your circumstances, your own thoughts. When we let our guard down. So Nehemiah left. He went to hang out with the king. And he finally asked permission, and the king says, okay, Nehemiah, you can go back and check on your people over there. So Nehemiah shows up. He had left a priest in charge of all these storerooms, and that's a whole other message that we can talk about, about leaders. But I'm not talking about that today. But he left him in charge. Now, what you, what you don't know about Eliashib is he's actually related to Tobiah. There's been a marriage, and so Tobiah is actually a relative. How many of you know those that are most familiar to you in your life, we will feel an obligation to do things that God never said to do. And we have to be very, very careful who and what we open our lives up to. That doesn't mean you disown people. God says we are called to love. We are called to show the love and demonstrate love and make disciples. That's what we're called to do. But we also have to be careful who is coming in. I've used this example before. How many of you women have ever had a baby in the room? Wave your hand at me. Y'all just seem to be a little bit, y'all went through something. Come on. You've had a few, right? You're very careful who you let in the birthing room. Not everybody gets to come in the birthing room. Why? Because you just don't know what's going to happen in the birthing room. I'm sure some of you girls could tell some stories in this room of things that happen in the birthing room. But we have to be careful who we allow in the places that God has set up in our lives. See, when you come and God sets you free, you get saved you give your life to Jesus, you make him Lord of your life, now there begins to become a process of exchange. Because getting saved does not in and of itself transform your lifestyle. Because now in order to be transformed, you have to change the things that have set up residence in the rooms of your house. Your house, the temple. Say, that's me. And so when we let our guard down and we get careless and we leave a door cracked open, we give legal intrusion to the enemy. You've heard me say this before. It was a few weeks ago. My makeup got stolen out of my car. It was very, very upsetting. It was disrespectful. 
But here's the thing. When the policeman came to interview me and asked me what happened and fingerprint my car and all these things, he asked me, was your car locked, Miss Fox? And I had to say, no. I left my car unlocked. When we leave things open, the enemy will come in. He doesn't care how great it looks on the front side. He doesn't care that your front door is locked. He doesn't care that that you overcame him up here and you're all up here. He's looking for what's back here. That you have left unlocked and you have left open for the enemy to just waltz himself right up in and take anything he wants and take up residence in your house. He's looking at what you're watching in the middle of the night. He's looking at what you're reading. He's looking for that conversation that you have that you don't want anybody to know about. He's looking for the vulnerable places that are familiar, that are weak, that you keep engaging with. That's what he's looking for. Is it okay if I just tell you the truth today? Let's just be real. Are we, do we struggle with those things? Yes. Do those temptations come? Yes. Paul said temptations will come. But you have to recognize what to do and how to shut the door. But for some of us, the enemy has been here so long. He has taken up residence so long. You now live in this cycle. Because those open doors create dysfunction. And the same sin happens over and over and over and over. And we experience temporary freedom. True freedom requires transformation. I'm going to say that again. True freedom requires transformation. Now you can get delivered of something in a moment. God can do a miracle. God can do anything. I know he's faithful. He is the miracle worker. He can do anything he wants to do. But I'm telling you, he's looking for us to make the decisions to walk out transformation. And it's those open doors that we have to find out where, wait a second, where has the enemy moved in? Some of, some of us should not be hanging out with the same dysfunction that you hung out with last year this same time. You're like, well, I don't know how I end up here. Because you haven't kicked the enemy out of that area of your life. And I don't know about you, but I get tired of fighting the same battle over and over. I thought I dealt with that, but it's back. I thought I got delivered of that, but it's back. I thought I was free from that, but here it is again. So we got to get out of that cycle. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. Amen? So here we were. This is the end of, of Nehemiah's story of what God did. These miracle after miracle after miracle overcame the enemy over and over and over and over. And literally because of this particular situation, it could have cost them everything. The, one of the strongest Um, opposition that was against them was Tobiah. He came openly and was very accusatory. He hired false prophets to prophesy lies. Like this dude, he did some stuff, right? And here Nehemiah leaves town and Elisha is like, oh man, Tobiah, you don't have anywhere to stay. Let's just take everybody's offerings and the incense for worship and all these things. Let's just move all those out and I'm going to let you move in there. That's what we do in our lives. Because we come and and we've we've said, God, I give you everything. I'm tithing. I'm, I'm doing all the things. I'm obeying. I'm worshiping. I'm praying. I'm reading your word. I'm doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. And all of a sudden, little by little... You let those things begin to slip. Oh, I just didn't have time today. Oh, I'm too busy. God will understand. And all of a sudden, 
the enemy is one by one removing the things that God has set up in your life. And he is moving in his couches and his chairs and his furniture and his belongings right up into that place in your life. Everybody in this room, you know it can happen so easy. <laughs> when I read this, I thought, are you serious? He let Tobiah move into the temple? Like, and removed everything out of the storeroom. All the things that God said, put them here and do it like this. They just moved all that out and let Tobiah come and, and live there. We do it with the enemy all the time. Every time you open your phone, you do it. I won't go there. So Nehemiah comes back and he is ticked, y'all. The, the, uh, the, uh, several other translations say he was angry. He was really angry. In this one, he says he was very displeased. I bet Nehemiah was ticked. I bet he came up in there like a hurricane, like, what in the world have you done? And it doesn't say he thought about it. He didn't have any conversations with anybody about it. He didn't ask anybody's opinion about it. It says he walked up in there and said, you're out. And all your stuff. There were three things that Nehemiah did. And I'm going to give these to you real quickly, and we're going to wrap, wrap up today. These three things are what we have to do over and over in our lives, in this temple, in your house that Nehemiah did. Number one, he evicted the enemy. He kicked the enemy out. He didn't go in and have some sweet meeting with Tobiah and say, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I know Elisha let you move in while I, well, move in while I was gone. But you know, if, if I think if I'm going to give you like 90 days and, and maybe we can help you find a place. No, no, because Nehemiah knew if he stayed there, he was going to defile what God had done in the temple. So we have to throw him out. <laughs> he threw Tobiah out. He evicted him. He kicked him out. The enemy will move in and remain before you even know he's there. Tim said it to me this way yesterday. He's like, he's like a squatter. Has anybody ever heard that term? Somebody who just shows up. It's not their property. It's not their house. But if they live there long enough, they think that they, it belongs to them. And in some states, including the state of Florida, if you've done that for more than seven years, it can legally be your property. That's what the enemy is doing in some of our lives. That bitterness has been there for seven years. And he's like, you don't understand. I have rights to be here. They did that to you. They did this and that, and it was their fault. And you're okay. You deserve to be bitter. Those are your emotions. And that squatter takes up residence. And then says, I have a right to be here. Bitterness has no right in your life. Fear has no right in your life. Unforgiveness has no right in your life. So we have to kick the enemy out. A squatter is a person that occupies a property without lawful permission. Quit giving the enemy legal intrusion in your life. The enemy will convince you because of your past, because of your failures, because of your cycles, that he belongs there. Well, let me tell you, he doesn't belong there. He does not belong there. you got to kick him out. I'm trying to use nice language today. But you got to kick him out. Proverbs 22.10 says this, Kick out the troublemakers and things will quiet down. Because you need a break from bickering and griping. That's what Proverbs 22.10 says. Quit engaging with troublemakers in your life. Well, I feel like God's called me to him. Okay, but if it's affecting you, then who's 
Influencing whom? We have to know that. And when your life is clear from the enemy, then you're going to be more effective to minister life to that person and bring them out of their troublemaking state. Amen? So the promise of God cannot enter your life when the past thing is living there. How many of you have ever had to share a room with somebody you didn't really enjoy? And do not talk about your spouse right now. Just... You're like, well, that's the only person. No, I'm just kidding. It's uncomfortable to share a room with somebody. So I'm a little bit of a neat freak and a little bit OCD. I'm just going to confess it right here in this room. And, um, and so t- Tim, t- he, listen, we've been married 32 years. So, you know, he's learned the way. And so it's great. But I can't stand... To share a room where things are everywhere. Thank you, Audrey. A mess. I just can't do it. I will do it, but my goodness. But here's the thing. You can't, you can't keep pursuing and getting mad at God because the promise that he set over your life or the purpose and plan isn't coming to pass when you won't move the enemy out of your rooms. You've got to make room for God to take up residence again in that room of your heart. The children of Israel live like this all the time. They always were longing to go back to bondage. It was so much better in Egypt. No, it just took a long time to get Egypt out of them. It was so, it had, it was so deep rooted. It had, it had been there so long. So we have to recognize that and you have to be wise to the enemy and what he's done and where he's moved in. And if there's a cycle that keeps happening in your life, that's probably where he's living. You've heard the story about um, Tim and I a while back that above my master bedroom, I heard this. So I was like, Tim, what does that sound? What does that sound? What does that sound? Oh, it's nothing, honey. So it was a full-on rat infestation above. Yes, it was bad. But here's the thing. I couldn't expect for anything clean or anything else to be able to get cleaned out until we killed the rats and got them out. All right, that's a whole other story that I'm not going to talk about today. Listen, even though we know Christ, you're not becoming like Christ if you don't kick the enemy out. Because you'll keep trying and trying to become like Christ, but you can't because everything in your house is taken up by the enemy. And that's why every day is such a battle. Stop being roommates with the enemy. James 4, 7 says this, So let God work his will in you and yell a loud no to the devil and watch him make himself scarce. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you will get up on your feet. The traditional version says, resist the devil and he will flee. I kind of like yelling aloud, no, to the devil. The second thing that Nehemiah did, you can read it right there in Nehemiah 13, 9. After he kicked Tobiah out and threw all his belongings out. It says in commentary, he actually threw everything he had out into the middle of the street. Nehemiah 13, 9, he says, And then I gave orders to purify the rooms. I gave orders to purify the rooms. Why did he need to come and purify the house? 
Because it's not just enough once you've kicked the enemy out. You got to come behind. You got to purify that place where he was taking up residence. Have you, have you ever been in a house that, that maybe there was a, a chain smoker in there or smoking other things and everything in there, every fiber of carpet, every drape, every curtain, every, everything smells like that. Because when the enemy's been somewhere, it sinks. And it smells like things have gotten into the crevices and the fibers of your life. And you got to purify that stuff. You got to go in and you got to do a deep clean <laughs> in some places in your life. Can you throw those pictures up? I think you guys have them back there. Um, it's been about uh, probably eight or 10 years ago. We were looking at some houses with a friend and and there was a house that was in our neighborhood, beautiful, y'all. This house was like over 3,000 square feet. The outside of it was gorgeous. It was all white. It had tons of windows. The yard was beautiful. I mean, it, I was like, this house, I cannot believe this house is only this much money. But it's because it was in foreclosure. And so we went to look at the house. And when we walked in the house... This is what we saw, and it was worse. I think there's another picture. But, I mean, there was, like, spray paint. They had, they had punched holes in the walls. They had, I mean, and it stunk. I, I literally thought they just used the whole house as their bathroom. I don't know. But here's the thing. I was like, this house is so beautiful. Why? Why would somebody do this? Obviously, they were angry, I'm sure, at the bank who was about to take their house. But here's the thing. This is what we allow the enemy to do. This is what it looks like when we don't purify. This is what it looks like. And we've got all this junk and we're like, but I kicked the enemy out. Yeah, they were evicted from this property, but this is what they left. And that's what the enemy, he's so sly. And we think, oh, I I've dealt with it. But you know you haven't dealt with it when you can't escape it. So we got to purify we got to purify things. We have to say no to sin. We have to say no to temptation. We have to be, uh, get a backbone and learn to say, no, that thing is not going to control me. I am not going to allow that thing back in my life. And whatever it is you think you cannot live without, that's probably the thing that God wants to purify. Whatever person you think you cannot live without, whatever toxic relationship, it's quiet in here. Whatever those things are, that's exactly the thing that you need to ask the Holy Spirit. Purify this thing. Take this desire away from me. I want to become like Christ. I want to be transformed into becoming like him. I don't know if God can help me. Yes, he can. He just needs your permission. You give the enemy all sorts of permission. we got to give God permission to come in and begin to purify us. we got to get back to a place of repentance where you come back to God and you say, remove these things from my heart. Remove these things. Remove the bitterness. Remove it, God. Remove the desire for that addiction. Re remove it, God. He can and he will if we give him permission. We have to get rid of it. You've got to change the atmosphere of your life. We've got to change the atmosphere. What does the atmosphere of your life look like? What does the atmosphere of your life smell like? What do other people experience when they get a glimpse of the rooms in your life? That's how we know. God, come purify me. We got to evict the enemy and then we got to purify the places in our house. We got to change the fragrance. It wasn't by accident that Tobiah uh, moved in where they kept the incense for worship, it got moved out. That was the fragrance of God's presence. All right, the last thing, I'm going to wrap this up. The last thing he, 
Nehemiah did, still in verse 9, it only took him two verses to do all this. So impressive. He said, I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. So you got to kick the enemy out. You got to find out where are the places I need to allow God to come and purify me, clean it up. And then you got to fill the room. You got to fill the house. Do you know that a house that is staged sells way better than a house that is not? Amen. I'm saying to real estate agents on the front row. Yes. Why? Because when something has, looks like somebody lives there, it's, 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 a way, it's a way better picture of what's going on. And here's the thing. If you leave an empty room in your life, the enemy will come back. You've got to fill it with the things that God intended for your life. You've got to refill the rooms of your life with the things that God said. I shared two weeks ago the phrase that Jadeen says all the time, I'm better when I'm busy. You might remember me sharing that. I'm better when I'm busy. Why? I'm better when things are full than if I have too many empty spaces and too much idle time, the enemy will find his way in every time. So he decided at this point, not only are we going to kick him out, and all his stuff, and we're going to clean it up, and we're going to purify it, and we're going to dedicate it back to God. Now we're going to refill it with everything that God intended. The offerings, the tithes, the incense, the grain, the olive oil, the wine. They put it all back into the storeroom because that was its rightful place. You know, we need to give God his rightful place place in our lives. You can't leave rooms empty. When Tim worked for uh, Hewlett Packard for 20 plus years, um, his office was in our house. Bless me, Lord. And this was when working from home was not as normal as it is right now. So when Tim was not on a trip, he was home all the time. And he had the biggest room upstairs that we have was his office. And I love him so much, but his office was a mess. I would walk in and like, I would have to do this. Like, I would be like, oh, trying to get to his desk over piles. It's true, honey. You know, it was true. It was functional for you. Yes, it was. But I had to step over all these piles to get to his desk, and it was such a mess. And I asked, I said, Lord, all I want in my house is a room that can be a guest room, because at that time, Jasmine was at home, and Sophia was at home, and there's three rooms upstairs, so I did not have a guest room. Like, we couldn't keep anybody. And I love to host people in my home. I enjoy that. I want to do that. And so I didn't have that. And I literally thought, there is no way we can ever turn this office into a beautiful guest room and so it took a lot of work and a lot of effort but I saw something that I had a picture and a dream that this was going to happen and it had to have full transformation and now I have this beautiful guest room and I've had the privilege of hosting Dave Wagner, when he comes to speak to us, um, my brother is there now a little, for a little while. But I, I mean, it's like I can host anybody in that beautiful room. And I'm so grateful to do that. But why? Why, why is that important? Because that's a picture of the promise of God for your life. Because he says, when you delight yourself in me, I will give you the desires of your heart. And there's things that you desire, but it's like I said, in order for that picture, you've got to ask God to begin to fill the room with what he showed you. Not fill the room with all the stuff that 
people want to put on you or the world and culture want to put on you or your past failures want to put on you. He wants you to see what he sees. And he wants to fill your room with what makes your heart happy, what makes your spirit leap on the inside of you. And some of you have given up on dreams. You've given up on promises. And this is a strategy for you to kick the enemy out, purify that thing, and begin to ask God to put those things into your life one by one. Well, I've been praying for a, to be married for 20 years. I've been praying for a baby. I've been praying for financial freedom. I've been, okay. It's time to fill the room with the things that God is telling you to put in the room so you can see it fulfilled. That's God's desire for you. Come on, just stand with me. When you put all the stuff back that God intended, other things begin to come back to your life. When you begin to put worship back in your life, peace and joy begin to come back to your life. When you begin to put prayer and getting the word of God in your soul every day, all of a sudden peace comes, freedom comes, insecurity leaves, confidence returns. See, that's what happens. It's such a simple process, but it starts with kicking the enemy out. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart. Luke 9.23 says, then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. It's not a one and done. It's never a one and done. He said, take up my cross daily. That means it's an everyday, for some of us, it's a moment by moment choice. I'm going to evict the enemy. God, come purify me. If you forgive me, then I'm forgiven. If you redeem me, then I'm redeemed. Come and purify me. And then God, what needs to be in my life? Who are the people who are supposed to live in my house? Who are, who are those relationships? What is it supposed to look like? And at the, at the end of that, at the end of that, it said that Nehemiah went because all the priests and Levites had left the temple and they were working in the fields because everything that was supposed to be there to feed them and provide for them had been removed. And it says that all of the worshipers and all the priests, they came back. He went and got them and put them back at their post. Some of you are at the wrong post right now in your life. But I believe that God... When you recognize and you begin to take authority over the enemy, God is going to begin to bring some things into your life that you've asked him for for a really long time. Well, I don't know if he can. Don't say that, Angela. I don't want to be disappointed again. God never disappoints. God never disappoints.